So good afternoon, everybody. I know we are heading towards the end of the semester. It's afternoon on a day that vaguely feels like spring. So I am so pleased to see a very full room. Uh, hi, my name is Saul Berman. I'm the University of Michigan's Chief Privacy Officer and the Interim Chief Information Security Officer. In addition, I am honored to be a part of the Dissonance Organizing Committee. On behalf of this multidisciplinary group of faculty and students, I want to welcome and thank you all for being a part of Dissonance Conversations at, at the Confluence of Technology, Policy, Privacy, Security, and Law. An extra special thanks to Gracie Trinidad. Gracie, wave for the crowd. Uh, she's a PhD student in health, infra health infrastructure and learning systems at the University of Michigan, and she really did the yeoman's work in organizing this session. So thank you so, so much. So for those of you who maybe have never been to a dissonance event or haven't been to one for a while, just a, a little bit about us. Um, the dissonance, dissonance event series seeks to engage the university community on timely topics, and I'm pretty sure AI is one of them, uh, that, uh, that have national and international importance. Uh, we seek to increase university-wide multidisciplinary discourse, and as you hear the background of each of our speakers, or you see up here where they're coming from, you'll see that this is a truly a multidisciplinary group. We also want to provoke thoughtful discourse and have fun along the way, and I am always happy to say that aside from refreshments and cookies and such, there's going to be great conversation. Please come with questions and think about uh, being provocative in, in a fun way along the way. So uh, let's see, talked about this. We also record all these events, so we're recording today, and if you want to see past events, they are ar archived on the Safe Computing website. Rather than reading through the litany of uh, active participants in the organizing groups, Notice that this is a very far-ranging group of, of organizations, from the College of Engineering to LSNA to the School of Public Health, Public Policy, various centers, med school, and more. So I've, I, I, I've been back in higher ed for about eight years, and I was, I was talking to Mike Wellman before we started today. There is nothing that makes me more proud and more engaged with the university community than having these sorts of multidisciplinary discussions. And there is no university that is better positioned to have them than the University of Michigan. So I don't say that by hyperbole. I've been a part of other universities. We truly are special in this space, and that's why it, it, I'm honored to have this group up here. So a few housekeeping things. Cell phones, keep them quiet. Uh, I mentioned the session being recorded, so check the Dissonance webpage later if you want to find out, uh, if you want to see it. Visit the, the, the Dissonance website if you want to sign up for or suggest other events. And then you can follow along on Twitter at UMichTech, so hashtag UMichTalks to tweet along, and somewhere right there. Okay. So housekeeping aside, let me frame the session a little bit and then turn it over to the people who you're really here to see. Artificial intelligence is weaving its way into every aspect of our lives, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. We don't need to wait for Westworld or iRobot to have AI be in our daily lives. We already have driverless cars, smart assistants, personalized services, whether Amazon, Netflix, Pandora, social media, and more, medical diagnoses, treatment and delivery systems, and yes, actual even robots. So for those of you who haven't looked, look up Sophia, uh, the world's first robot citizen. As Gregory Simpson, Chief Technology Officer for Synchronicity Financial stated, if we're gonna be augment humanity with the machine, we need to do it in a way that doesn't bring along our mistakes of the past. So with the glory of AI comes the risks of AI. And this evening's session will take a multidisciplinary look at the social implications of artificial intelligence and consider the promises and potential pitfalls we may look forward to. So get ready for an exciting conversation. Prepare your questions and comments. Now let me turn things over to Mike Wellman, the Lynn A. Conway Collegiate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the College of Engineering. Mike, take it away. So thank you, I'm very happy to be here. It looks like we brought just the right number of chairs. Uh, this should be an interesting conversation. Um, very pleased to be part of this dissonance series. Uh, it's a very uh, dissonant time to be an AI researcher. Um, I got my PhD in artificial intelligence over 30 years ago now, and I joined the field because I thought it seemed logical that the future of the world was the future of smart machines. and. I'd want to be part of that. And I, I, think, I still think that the future of the world is the future of smart machines and 
therefore the implications of that would be relevant. They just seem more urgent uh, now maybe than they did uh, back then. So to kick things off, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words and then uh, we have an, uh, an excellent, very um, uh, expert set of panelists. Saul just uh, mentioned this uh, epigram that was used as part of the advertising for the series. Um, and I thought I would just give some re reaction to it. I don't know Gregory Simpson, and I don't really mean to pick on him or anything like that, but uh, it just made me think a little bit. Uh, I'll start with the first word. Um, if we are going to augment humanity, there, there is no if about uh, this. It's, it, the, 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 it's not like we have a choice, actually. We could stop it or, or keep it going. Let, you know, let's go with the working assumption that uh, things like this are coming. And um, uh, because if we're imagining that we can choose a path or not, we're going to waste a lot of time probably on, on, on that. Um, that we need to do it in a way that doesn't bring along our mistakes of the past. Um, I also break it to you that we are going to make some mistakes. We're going to make some of the mistakes of the past, and we're going to make some brand new mistakes that we just thought of. Uh, and obviously, when we shape uh, how we're going to deal with AI technology, we need to do it considering the fallibility of ourselves and our institutions and our politics and you know our, our economy and everything else. Uh, that even makes it yet yet more more challenging. So. Um, it, if we want to understand the, the, the tagline for this, the social implications of AI, what is it that we need to understand? And I'm not going to uh, go in depth in this or, or answer them, but I think we can maybe help organize the conversation. We need to understand what the technology is, what it can do now, what it is likely to be able to do uh, in the future, both in the near future and the far future. Um, what areas of society and the economy will AI have Impact. It will have impact in all areas of society, I think, but there may be some, some worthwhile thoughts about which are the places where it's going to have the mostest, soonest uh, kind of impact. And we'll hear, I think, some um, ideas about that from our panelists. Um, and then, um, obviously, just thinking about the future um, doesn't have a point unless we can imagine we can influence the future in some way. There are many different levers that we might have to do that. Some of it is in technology itself. Uh, we, there's no central control of it. There's, there's lots of uh, companies and private individuals and nation states that are all involved in it, and there's no single authority over them. Uh, but to the extent that we're in our own spheres can allocate resources, we may, may be able to shape it in more productive ways. Um, the political system has some role in regulation, particularly in, in, in specific narrow areas where AI might get um, applied in the near term, uh, where regulation uh, might uh, play a role or uh, certain policy choices. That's really difficult because law and policy move really slowly compared to technology and compared to understanding of uh, uh, and technology. Uh, understanding often lags, but in some areas we'll actually need to do it. And then finally, um, I'll just say preparation and mitigation. Um, if you can't necessarily um, avoid um, the impacts that you don't like and only get the impacts that are great, there will be lots of, of course, super positive impacts of AI. Uh, we can think about mitigation strategies. How do we um, avoid the, um, the consequences from getting too bad? Okay. The final thing I want to say is that some, I've been in a lot of these kind of conversations about um, the future of AI, and sometimes they get really confused because people are talking about multiple timescales. And I'm just going to uh, crudely break it down into two. Uh, one is the now and the near term. Uh, these are, uh, as actually Saul already mentioned, it's, AI is not you know, some science fiction story. It's things that we have today or will very soon. And there's, there's mostly about, I would say, autonomy, uh, increasing automation of things, and amplification. The trends are already existing. We will see more data exploitation. We will see more automation of uh, our daily lives. More and better autonomy in, more, in a wider sphere of activity. This, no doubt, uh, even if it's a you know, it just a, a continuation of a trend, will have discontinuous um, effects in many arenas. And, if, and perhaps some of the most sensitive points are the labor force, uh, the economics of people uh, um, uh, having their living, gaining their living, uh, political sphere, um, uh, bots influencing elections, who would have who thought, um, in the military. Uh, important areas to think about. Now, 
in these discussions, we often sometimes are also thinking about what might be the farther future, and I'll put the label superintelligence. This is the AI that can do everything as well or better, and really better than, than people can. Um, uh, this is, this proposes a whole uh, additional layer of concerns about being able to control the technology, uh, keeping the world uh, safe from maybe potential existential threat of AI. Uh, the whole notion of human work can be called into question by superintelligence. Uh, when this will happen is highly uncertain. Experts will disagree. Um, the um, Fact is, it could be very far away, maybe beyond all of our lifetimes. Um, it could be much sooner. It could happen relatively suddenly. There's different explanations about that, which I won't go into. Uh, the point I want to make, though, today is that we can have both of these conversations, both think about the implications of AI in the long term uh, and also the shorter term one. We have no choice but dealing with the shorter term one you know, right now. Uh, we don't have to choose. Uh, possibly thinking about what we do to address the shorter term implications will give us some good ideas about the longer term ones. The longer term ones, because they can happen suddenly, because they're so fundamental, we really do need to start thinking about them now. I think it just helps when we talk about it to be clear about which time scale that we're talking about them. Okay, so I, I expect that our panelists will talk about um, a lot about the first earlier scale, but uh, maybe also some of the later ones. Um, and so let me not delay um, them any further. Uh, I will start by um, introducing our first uh, panelist. This is uh, Professor Ella Atkins, who uh, is from the uh, Department of Aerospace Engineering, professor there. Uh, Ella got her PhD from the University of Michigan uh, in computer science. Uh, then spent some time on the faculty at Maryland before coming back uh, here again to join the faculty in aerospace uh, engineering here. Very glad to have, have her back. Ella Atkins. So it's kind of interesting. I really loved airplanes, and so when I did computer science and saw all of the wonders of AI, I decided that it needed to be for airplanes, and so I've been working on that particular version of it, which means, yes, I'm going to talk about the more near-term stuff. I watched movies like Stealth and others, and I think these are just scare tactics. They're not where we are, and it's not clear that we'll ever be there. But let me get started, because I only have 10 minutes. Um, I have a lot of pictures on my slides, because I want you to think about things in multiple contexts, and with respect to the groundings that we have today in things like law, technology and so forth. So what I'm showing here is a very brief overview of AI and privacy from my viewpoint. We all know uh, that right now we have a grounding of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And I put it verbatim here rather than with any interpretation because I think it's important to recognize that the Constitution was written a long time ago, as were its amendments. So when you read it, it's a little bit hard to connect the dots from that over to the notion of facial recognition and the implications of that. So I cite at the bottom, actually, a t it's either today or yesterday, yesterday's New York Times article that showed that for $60, they could recognize 2750, 2,750 faces of people in Bryant Park. So that was uh, kind of interesting. And then I throw the drone here, not only because I like drones, but because that's our future, right? It's not just the cars driving around with cameras looking next to the road. It's also the drones. They're looking in your windows because they can get anywhere. Maybe that's a scary slide, but let's move on. <laughs> Maybe this one is more scary, right? AI and arms. And I don't mean these arms. I mean the arms that you see there in the pictures. So uh, when Ben Kuypers from Computer Science and I taught a class last year called uh, ethics for robotics. Uh, one of the things he brought in was this video uh, published by Stuart Russell from AI and some others that showed this really scary notion of AI getting onto all kinds of drones and being used for violent purposes. So in the upper right you see part of that video where a whole bunch of drones are launched out of the back of a van and they fly into a classroom and shoot all the students. Right? So think this room right now, hopefully it won't happen, right? but that's the kind of scenario that's in that video. Uh, and so then they also talk about the large, scary drones that have no people on them and can carry larger weapons. Uh, upper left, 
Uh, that's kind of an inverse problem where you have the person that doesn't like the drones that pulls out their firearm and shoots up into the sky. One of the things that I want you to think about on all of these slides is the duality between the AI on some kind of agent being the threatening thing versus the person being the threatening thing. And when you think about that duality, what you begin to think about is that it's more compli complicated than not like liking the AI because the people have a long history of also doing some good and some pretty scary things. We expect the same for the AI agents. Uh, at the bottom, that's kind of a reminder, and it's called No AI, right? And maybe you can recognize some of the things there. The one on the right was from Las Vegas a couple of years ago. And the reason to bring those up is that if we begin imagining all of the scary things that AI can do, maybe we forget two things. One, the scary things people can do, and the second thing is how the AI on things like drones can help stop the scary things. All right, AI safety and trust. I work on autonomy mostly for aircraft, but also think about perception, decision making, and acting for kind of vehicles. And for me, an autonomous vehicle doesn't necessarily mean a car, it means something that has the ability to carry people or payloads from place to place. Uh, so um, bottom right, um, you can, I'll talk about it later. I would go way past 10 minutes if I got started talking about the 737 MAX. But let's just say the interesting news of today is that after all of the re news reports that have been out, the FAA doesn't see a need for more pilot training. Right, let that soak in for a minute, because if you read the, the media reports for a long time, they were like, ah, bad Boeing, not only did they have software bugs, but they didn't train the pilots properly. Well, so they fixed their software, and the bottom line is now they've decided since they've fixed the software that they don't need any more pilot training. You can talk about that later if you want. So now let's look at other contexts. If you look at the bottom right and you see the terrible Ethiopian Airlines crash and then move your eyes up to the upper right. That's a Tesla X, Model X crash right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And what happened there is that there was an autopilot that kept speeding up the car right before it hit the wall. Right? So that was clearly a problem with the software as well. They're very similar, but we barely heard about the one on the upper right, whereas everybody who has opened any website has heard about the one on the bottom right. That's kind of an unequal thing. Let me also point out Toyota Guardian, which probably will save a lot of lives. Guardian is doing exactly the same thing that the MCAS system on the 737 did. It's just a different venue. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna have fully autonomous airplanes, which puts the level of autonomy on this Boeing 737 MAX to shame. This is the last slide that I have, and it has a myriad of pictures. Whenever people talk about AI and how it's being infused, there's the question, will jobs be lost? So here, I spent quite a lot of time, probably more than I should have, collecting a lot of pictures. So let me walk you through them and then I'll be done. If you look at the top row, on the upper left, you see a picture that was taken before the assembly line. So what you see there are machines and people are at each machine building parts. They were craftsmen, they built the tools, they built the parts, and then they manually assembled them. That was a very time intensive process, but people felt proud to be machinists that had high skill levels. Next, you see the assembly line. Much more efficient, lots of people, but it was perhaps a little less creative because the company told you what to do and you did it. Now we look at the upper right. Far fewer people on the assembly line today because there are a lot of robots that are helping with a lot of the assembly tasks. The people are not gone but there are fewer of them than in either of the other pictures. Now let's look at the cars, right? We go from having no computers whatsoever in that 1950s car to having something like the Prius that had a lot of computer technology, including um, managing the power between the gas engine and the electric um, power system to the Tesla, which you saw on the last slide, to the Google car that didn't have a steering wheel, right? And now there's a question mark after that. Where does it go? Right, so if you look at that whole sequence, we're already to the point with cars where we're willing to climb in and at least have it drive slow when there's no steering wheel. Now we look at the planes, analogy, right, all the way across. I put the 737 MAX from Southwest that's now sitting on the ground as the third one over, right under the Tesla Model X intentionally, let me point that out. And then we also have these urban air mobility platforms that are coming out. 
and they look very similar, right? You would never imagine them to be mass-produced any more than you imagine the Google car to be mass-produced exactly like it is. But it's a concept that's going to get people used to being in those vehicles without drivers and without steering wheels and without controls. So then at the bottom, I want to point out two things. One, you see a lot of robots doing things that are useful, like caring for people, interacting with people, helping people who are paralyzed eat, for example. Um, and this one, I really like because that's a, something that humans couldn't do. That shows a robot at the Fu Fukushima reactor uh, retrieving some radioactive material. If a human went there, they would die. So these are things that the robots really need intelligence to do, and they're not taking jobs that people want now. They're augmenting what we can do with people now. Then I also want to point out this operator and all of those people. The jobs that we used to put on the machinist in the assembly line are now going into people sitting at computers, right? If you look at the density of people, it's the same kind of deal. A lot of people are working together to solve problems that will make money for the company and hopefully benefit society. They're just doing different jobs. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ella. Our, our next panelist is Kintaro Toyama. He is the W.K. Kellogg Professor of Community Information at the School of Information here at Michigan. Uh, Kintaro got his PhD in computer science from Yale, uh, went to Microsoft where he did uh, research in computer vision and multimedia, helped uh, co-found uh, Microsoft Research India, started doing work in uh, understanding the impact of technology in developing world. Um, uh, which is a lot of his expertise today, Kintaro. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thanks to um, the dissonance organizers. So I suspect I'm going to be the outlier on the <laughs> panel. Um, I'm going to start with this graph, which shows you the in the bottom green line the rate of poverty in the United States. Uh, it start on this graph. It starts at about 1960 and goes until the present. Um, if you were able to draw this line back to about 1940, what you would see was that there was a steady decline in the rate of poverty from about mid 1940s to about 1970, and then since then it's been fixed. This is in the United States, where you know we're arguably the world's richest country. A poverty rate of 13 to you know 13 to 14 percent, as it's been in the last few years, is you know is actually quite embarrassing, I would say. Now. Um, uh, despite everything that you have heard from Silicon Valley and people who believe in technology as a way to solve uh, various social problems, um, one of the interesting things is that during this last 40 to 50 years of stagnation for people in poverty, uh, we have seen an explosion of digital technologies, right? Everything that you think of as uh, digital basically was invented, uh, designed, and then went pretty much mainstream over the last 40 to 50 years. Right? So if you believe in any kind of story in which technology is the main reason why society gets better, I'm suggesting with this graph that that's not quite the case. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, technology is the reason why um, um, uh, the fight against poverty has stagnated, but I do believe that technology by itself, no matter how good it is, no matter how widespread it becomes, is not the underlying cause for addressing problems like poverty. Um, sometimes people say, well, okay, that's poverty. What about some other things that we care about? Well, you know, especially these days we worry about political polarization. Uh, you know, those of you who might remember the early days of social media might remember that we used to say this about social media, right? Now we'll have lots of ways to connect with each other and we'll learn to empathize with people we never otherwise interact with. There'll be peace and kumbaya. Well, exactly the opposite has happened during the same period of time where all of this technology was invented and went mainstream. Um, in this case, I actually think technology has a role in the polarization in that the proliferation of technology has actually amplified what was already there as a certain amount of uh, political polarization. Now, the way that I explain this kind of phenomenon and also the fact that all of us in this room all have various gadgets which we believe are helping us be more productive is that technology for the most part amplifies underlying human forces. Okay, now amplification is a very simple idea. It's basically saying technology is a tool. We put that tool to the use that we want for it. Um, but it has a number of corollar corollaries that people don't necessarily uh, understand about amplification. So for example, one of them is exactly this point, which is if you start off with some kind of disparity, whether it's a political one or a social one or an economic one, amplification means with more technology, that disparity only increases. Inequality gets worse with more technology. 
Um, now, one of the big questions about amplification is, you know, what are the human forces I'm talking about? So most of you, if you think about, again, think about what technology you use. Uh, I'm expecting that most of you will probably have smartphones. Um, the number of companies that are basic, that you're spending your time with on your devices is actually surprisingly small. It's about five or six of the biggest companies. If you use you know, Facebook, or if you use Uber, or if you use Google, those are basically the things that you spend your time with. Those companies, li literally four or five companies in the world, are having an outsized influence on your experience of technology. And so what they think about uh, is critically important for us to understand and what is actually being amplified. So how many of you have seen the movie The Matrix? Oh, okay, this is good. Uh, I sometimes ask this of our undergrads, and it's like, nobody has even heard this movie. But anyway, that was a 1999 movie. Um, so in the movie The Matrix, right, there was an advanced technology that harvests human energy uh, to feed their machine masters, all while offering all of us the illusion of a pleasant life. Now, this is science fiction. In the movie, they say that they think they're about 200 years since about now. Um, I'm going to suggest that that science fiction future is actually much, much closer to us than you might imagine, because Facebook for example, is an advanced technology that harvests human attention to feed shareholders all while offering the rest of us the illusion of a pleasant social life. Right now, I don't mean to pay, uh, pick on Facebook. Um, actually, I probably do, but, uh, <laughs> but there are plenty of other technology companies for which their main goal is to extract more of our attention or more of our income for the purposes of feeding their shareholders. That is their primary goal. In fact, it is even a legal goal in the United States. The SEC says for a public company that a company must must ensure that it is providing good returns for its uh, shareholders, or at least try to do so. Um, so given that that's the underlying motivation for these companies, you, you cannot, you know, assuming that you believe in amplification, we have to accept that those companies' goals, which is, is self-enrichment for its shareholders, are the primary thing that's going to be amplified with more technology. Right? The only way that this doesn't work out is if the technology is designed and created and ultimately disseminated by an entity that doesn't believe that profit making is its primary goal. Okay, and so far we have not figured that model out. We have a lot of government support of research to develop new technology, but we don't have a lot of government running of actual technology. Um, finally, I want to make one point about amplification. So. Uh, I'm going to make an analogy with vehicles. So the interesting thing about a uh, amplification is that on the one hand, you might say, well, technology is kind of neutral. And actually, you've already heard that from um, our speakers so far. Uh, I agree completely. It's entirely up to the human beings in terms of how the technology gets used. It could be positive. It could be negative. You know, if we're really confident and it's always going to be positive, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't develop more technology. On the other hand, if you have some doubts about that, we should be very careful. And the reason is the following. If you have a bicycle, you need a little bit of skill to make sure that you can drive it safely. You know, the worst thing that might happen is you might trip and hurt yourself. But it's very, it's relatively limited what damage you can do to the rest of the world. That's not true with cars, right? The damage you can do to other people is significant. So at least in this country, we expect that you have to get a certain amount of training and then actually be licensed in order to operate a vehicle. What about rockets? You need a lot more training. And we certainly are not going to give out rockets to the random person on the street, even if they have a reasonable amount of training. It's just too dangerous, right? And so the same is true with technologies of information, which is to say that a little bit, very, there's very limited harm that any one person can do. With a lot, and I believe this is true of AI, which you know, I think potentially has the power to be something akin to you know, nuclear power uh, as far as digital technologies go, um, we need to be much, much more careful about who is in control of it and what we believe in terms of regulation. One of the interesting things about atomic power, uh, the history of atomic power, is that when the scientists who first started um, experimenting with it and ultimately led to the development of the nuclear bomb, very quickly they realized this was a power that needed to be contained. And they started activating very actively among governments across multiple countries so that there was ultimately led to something that you know, we know as the nuclear non-proliferation uh, treaty. And the amazing thing about that treaty is that currently there are only nine countries in the world that have nuclear weapons, right? That's a shocking thing if you think about it. We are way past that point for AI, right? Like we are not going to be able to pull this AI back and limit it to just nine countries. Um, but I do think that we need to be very, very careful about uh, regulation and so on. Uh, Michael showed a slide in which he, you know, he, he said, well, you know, sometimes you have to resort to regulation. I would say it much more strongly, which is regulation and policy is the only way to ensure that all of this stays in because that's ultimately what's going to get amplified out in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kintaro.
our, our final panelist is Ram Vasudevan. Ram is assistant professor of mechanical engineering uh, here at Michigan, also affiliated with uh, the Transportation Research Institute and the Robotics Institute. Uh, Ram got his PhD in electrical engineering at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's a specialist in, um, in control theory and the application of controls to autonomous systems, uh, including robots and autonomous vehicles. Great, and let's hope I can actually get the presentation to work, so we'll see, all right, huh? Okay. So we're worried about AI and it can't get the presentation to work. Okay, great, okay, so um, this is actually, in contrast to my panelists, probably gonna be more of a selfish talk. So, and by that I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own history and sort of relate that to what I'd argue is sort of the context of uh, AI, at least as I see it. So as, as Mike introduced me, uh, myself, I, I grew up in Southern California. I went to Berkeley for my undergrad and my PhD. And actually my first time in Michigan, uh, I was working with Ford Motor Company as a PhD student in 2010. And they brought me out to Sault Ste. Marie. Does everyone know where Sault Ste. Marie is? In uh, February. And we were, <laughs> we were tasked with controlling a self-driving car uh, which is a Jaguar in this instance, because Ford did not have a self-driving car at that point. And our goal here was to actually get this car to do high-speed lane change maneuvers to try to illustrate that on ice, we could do really exciting things at really high speed. And in fact, because my colleagues thought it would be really humorous for a Southern California kid to enjoy the snow, they had me videotaping this outside in the very, very cold weather. And nevertheless, I mean, it was an, a really interesting experience. And in fact, um, many of the folks that are inside of this car have done really extraordinary things. So uh, for instance, the person sitting in the passenger seat in the front actually created the uh, autopilot for Tesla and was one of the lead engineers on that project. The person sitting in the back of the car actually headed Uber's ATG, uh, which has been doing really, really exciting work on autonomy. I think the person in the front is actually someone who does a lot of work still with Ford on autonomous vehicles and whatnot. And so, you know, um, what I want to convince you is that, you know, self-driving cars are really, really hard. And so this is a video of me sitting in the back, and this is the same controller, us trying to get the system to actually do a lane change maneuver. And I'm doing the recording here. We have a safety driver who's being very, very careful. And again, this is really, really exciting stuff. And Lots and lots of bad things can happen really, really quickly. And what I want to convince you is that AI, you know, in the ways that we think about it, we're sort of convinced that autonomy is going to happen immediately or that all of these problems are really going to be solved in the near term. Um, I want to take a step back here and actually tell you from sort of the field of fighting in the, the front lines of these problems that we really have a long way to go. And so I think the types of AI we should be concerned about are going to look a, a very specific way. And I'm going to try to convince you of that by just showing you some plots and showing you some results of, of what we're able to do right now. And I always like to begin by sort of taking a look at human driving. So humans are amazing drivers, OK? So this is statistics from NHTSA, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. They have statistics for vehicle fatalities all the way beginning in 1920, all the way until now. And on the y-axis here, we have the number of fatalities per 100 million miles traveled in the United States. That isn't just in Arizona or in Southern California or in Northern California. That is in the United States. That is driving in Sault Ste. Marie. That's driving in Ann Arbor in the winter. And the numbers are amazing. Humans are fantastic drivers. We start off with 24 fatalities per 100 million miles driven, and we go all the way down to one fatality per 100 million miles driven. We're amazing at driving. And you know, a lot of the great successes we've had with improving the safety of these systems have been you know, developed by engineers at the University of Michigan and other places. Some of these technology advancements, we wouldn't call AI, we would just call them common sense. Mass adoption of traffic lights, modern speed limit. It seems so obvious. Again, I'm, I'm from India. If you drive in India, these two uh, innovations have seemingly not arrived. <laughs> And as we keep moving forward, I mean, we start getting closer and closer to what we could nominally think of AI. Seat belts, that doesn't seem very much like AI. Airbags, that doesn't seem very much like AI. But anti-lock braking systems, electronic stability control, those are starting to get to the point of looking a lot like what I would call sort of uh, maybe retrograde, retrograde AI. These are systems that are intelligent enough to know how to operate the system and take over control when they need to. So if, if I went to my mom and I described what an AI system was and I pointed at these systems and I didn't call them something that lived inside of her car, 
she would probably think that they actually are AI. And in fact, in a lot of ways, they are satisfying sort of the core tenets of what we would think about as AI, at least rudimentarily. Now, it's really exciting. You can see that it becomes really, really hard to develop these types of systems and get big safety improvements. This is why all of the big car companies and all of the big tech companies are now really interested in pushing this number down by building self-driving cars. Humans are the reason that accidents happen, right? So what I want to convince you is we have a long way to go to build the type of statistics that we would want to see in order to believe that these autonomous systems are truly as safe as humans or safer. This is Waymo. I'm going to pick on one person or one company. This is Waymo. This is the leaders in autonomous vehicle driving at the moment. They've driven 10 million miles total. That is, starting in 2009, mostly in California, they've driven a total of 10 million miles. Again, we drive 100 million miles before there's one accident, and that's throughout the entire United States. They're going to have to do a heck of a lot of more driving in order to really get to a place where they can say something about safety. Now, what my group does a lot of things about, or what a lot of work in, is thinking about techniques that we can do to verify these types of systems. And sometimes we do deploy these systems, maybe not in Ann Arbor. This is at the University of Sydney. We've actually developed sort of a taxi service where we sort of drive around inside of here, understand what's going on, and can actually prove things about the safety of these systems without having to operate at really grand scales. What does our technology rely on? Well, it relies a lot on being able to understand what's going on in the world. And these systems are imperfect, but here's an example of the types of things that we're actually able to do. This is actually in Carytown in the winter. And what you'll see is our technology is actually able to detect people at a distance and build models of them and be able to make predictions of their behavior. And that type of prediction and those types of analysis are what we need to be able to safely control these types of systems. And in fact, you know, what I'd argue is that you know, these systems are in their infancy. We're just starting to get OK at this. And you know, the University of Michigan does some really, really cool stuff in this area. I happen to work in a group where we are able to do really, really exciting things in this area. But I will say, in total honesty, that we have a really long way to go before we can ever get these systems behaving in a way that I would feel comfortable operating in and around. Now, the sad thing is, and I'll jump to the next slide just for a second, you know, the only way that we really know at the moment to verify that these systems operate correctly is to drive them around and really verify that these systems, when they're sort of carefully monitored by humans, actually behave correctly. The challenge here is you know, these vehicles cost on the order of about $250,000 to build and then several million dollars per month to run. Nevertheless, they're collecting a heck of a lot of data about what's going on in the world. And basically, at the moment, they're just a big, gigantic sinkhole of money for most of these tech companies, automobile companies. But what I'll say is the one thing that they're really, really good at and what they're able to use AI to do is collect models of humans as they're driving around. And I'll, I'll sort of make this big, big claim that the thing that we really should be most concerned about when it comes to AI, at least in the short term, is not necessarily worrying about sort of autonomous systems or the super intelligent system, but really worrying about the lazy AI system that makes lots of, let's say, um, guesses about the people that they're interacting in and around. And those guesses can be really, really wrong. Now, sometimes they can be really right, like our systems. But even our systems can get things wrong at some distances where we make assumptions about things and they're just simply not right. Now, in the long term, Hopefully, we'll start solving these problems. But in the short term, if I was a tech company and I could get things about 90% right, it's probably not good enough for me to be able to drive an autonomous vehicle around safely. But it is certainly good enough for me to be a data broker and sell all of your data to marketing companies and make a heck of a lot of money to support my driving activities. So I'll end there on that scary note, <laughs> hopefully starting some conversations. But thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess first, anything quick from the panelists, or should we open up for questions? Okay. One thing. So uh, I wanted to comment that while Waymo hasn't driven autonomously more than 10 million miles, if you look at Boeing and Airbus, the number of autonomous flight miles that they have had is extraordinary. Okay. Okay. Um, We've got plenty of time for questions from the audience. Raise your hand. What's... 
it didn't seem, is it, can you hear that? Okay. Uh, do uh, planes, their autonomous systems, do they do the landings and takeoffs? Last time I knew they did not, but that was a while back. I'm experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an airplane. That's, that was a manual failure. Um, so yes, they can. There are uh, some airports that they can do that at and others that they can't. Uh, it depends on the navigation equipment available. If you've ever flown into an airport where it was completely foggy and you couldn't see a thing and then you felt the gear touchdown, a pilot can't see, right? That is the plane landing. Now, there are policies because we want attentive pilots as we fly that say we want the pilots to be manually flying as much as possible for takeoffs and landings because they can react a lot faster if something goes wrong if they're actually controlling the airplane, whereas if they're hands off, they don't feel anything. They don't, they're scanning, but it's not, the response time is slower. So the answer is yes, we can do it, but typically, we don't ask the pilots to do it because of training and situational awareness purposes. I should also not be completely 100%, um, you know, yes, we can. If it's nominal situations, we can, right? The reason the people are there is because the current flight management systems were never designed to be fully autonomous, and they totally rely on the people to back up the automation, turn it off, and do what's necessary if it fails. But in a fly-by-wire airplane, they cannot fly manually. The computers are between them and all the controls. Um, with regard to the regulations um, and like the legal landscape, how do you stop, you know, essentially the bad guy factor? If anyone in their dorm room, anywhere in the, in the world, essentially, can basically have as much force as an atomic bomb, how do you how do you fight that aspect of it? Uh, yeah. So I think I mean, first of all, um, you know, I think it's actually still difficult for. I mean, the real you know the real entities you want to be uh, concerned about are reasonably well-funded organizations that want to use technology in a certain way. Um, you know, even somebody in their basement, there's going to be some limit to the kind of damage they can do if only because they'll only be able to command, let's say, a certain number of you know computers to their purpose and so on. Um, and there's always going to be a cat and mouse game in terms of security versus you know people doing bad things uh, online. I think that's an area where. As a society, we could be investing much more in ensuring certain kinds of secure things so that we could actually enforce the laws that we have on the books. Um, but I think the, you know, the bigger question in all of this is still, you know, we don't even have the basic regulation. You know, as I think it was, I forget if it was Sol or Michael who mentioned, but the regulation tends to always, the law always tends to be behind the technology. And so uh, for that reason, I think we need to have regulation in place that is actually a little bit conservative, right? So as much as I do think that there are ways to use technology in a positive way, you know, the real questions in our world are not about how to make collectively our, you know, people in this room's lives better. I mean, what are we imagining this technology is going to do? I mean, it's not, it's not like I feel like I have a great need to make my own material life better, and though it might be better in some ways. The real question is how do we distribute what we have to other people who don't have the same level of, um, you know, same quality of life? And that's just not a technology question. And so, um, you know, to me, I think it's pretty, I would say it's much safer to be somewhat conservative in terms of the regulation and the laws around how technology can be used um, and be a little bit, you know, a little bit conservative with respect to that and then we'll be willing to pull back laws where we feel like it's too much uh, than the converse. And um, again, I think of it in terms of, you know, we, I, it, there's very simple things that everybody has seen in the news that if you link together, you could easily imagine a rogue, you know, a rogue system somewhere without any human being intending it doing very bad things. And one of the ways to do that, prevent that is to have very strong regulation. Like with cars, I'm actually not that worried about autonomous cars killing people because the car companies have zero incentive to allow that ha happen. Right? But I am a little bit more concerned about all the data that's floating around that we all know is being sold about us and how that's being used in clandestine ways that we can't even imagine. That's much more worrisome, um, even though you know, it doesn't seem like it's actually killing individual people. Uh, I'll just add, I, mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. And it suggests that to really have effective, um, least safe regulation for artificial intelligence, you have to solve the problem of computer security, which uh, is probably not an optimistic uh, point to make out. But I'm not sure that really the, the, the boundary between uh, AI safety and cybersecurity is very much blurry. 
um, in my mind, it's really much of the same. I agree with Kintaro that the this different, and as he pointed out, the different spheres of regulation are more likely to be successful in certain areas. I think autonomous vehicles is one that's aligned well for success because there's a few big players that have the ability to make vehicles and will coordinate. Another area that, that I've myself uh, focused on is um, uh, is in fin financial trading, where algorithmic trading really took over um, the, the, what's going on in financial markets without any uh, regulation, because someone in their basement can pretty much write a trading algorithm and uh, can do that. And you know, th there are um, you know possibly some limits to damage to others that because you need a lot of money, um, but. People can do a lot of damage to themselves uh, through this technology today. Um, it seems as if this autonomous uh, airplane flying is is possible as opposed and is much further ahead than autonomous vehicle autonomous cars. And so I'm wondering, is that true? And I mean, how many years behind, or what would it take for autonomous uh, car driving to to catch up with autonomous plane flying? So I'll look forward to Ram's answer to that <laughs> later, but uh, I will agree with you. And I think uh, in all seriousness, there are some simplifications when you fly, such as that there aren't pedestrians wandering around in the sky, no bicycles, right? We recently have the problem with drones, right? But the reality is that's a lack of regulation catching up to technology problem because People shouldn't be buying the latest DJI toy and going out to Detroit Metro and seeing if they can capture a video of a plane landing, right? That is not a good idea, right? And there are rules against it, but we haven't figured out how to enforce them yet, but please don't do that. Um, so I think the reality is with aviation, we're looking at the final details in managing anomalies and failures before we get that final step to full autonomy that's safe. Whereas I think we're somewhat behind on the ground because we haven't had this legacy of development of autopilot systems. The first autopilot for an airplane goes way, way back before the digital computer, right? And we haven't really done that with ground vehicles. So I agree with you, but I think there are still a lot of challenges. And as we get all these unmanned vehicles that have all these different missions flying around in the sky, we have to face a really hard problem in human machine interaction where some of the planes have people that the passengers want to keep up front to keep them feeling safe. They want to talk by voice. They want to look out the window. And then we have the drones that they can't see and that don't talk by voice. When they mix, there's going to be some pretty important challenges to solve. And yeah, just, to, just to add to that point, what, I say, what I'd say, I agree with Ella, by the way. So um, I think the thing... Yeah, I think the nominal, the comparison would be to say, um, if we on the, on the autonomous vehicle side, meaning the ground vehicle side, had uh, dedicated highways and we had rules that, for example, were controlled by some sort of overlord, like a air traffic control system, for instance, it would nominally create a system that would look a lot more like what we have in air travel at the moment. And what we have instead is like drones everywhere flying near our airports all of the time. And that's how we monitor our ground vehicle system. And so you have to be dealing with the drones, which in this instance may be my dog or maybe me, right? running off in the middle of the street and you need to be guarded against that behavior and building computing systems that can deal with that type of uh, anomaly all of the time is a really really hard ask at the moment um what i'll add to that is you know inevitably the next question that people ask when they talk about uh, ground vehicles and and self-driving cars is hey what about solving sort of the trolley problem and this ethical issue of do i decide to kill you know rom or do i decide to kill uh, ella atkins right and in that instance, what I would say is, you know, our systems are just not intelligent enough for us to answer these types of ethical questions. Like, if my, if my system was smart enough to realize that this is ROM, I would be like, go ahead and kill me. That's amazing, right? At the moment, <laughs> the place we're at is a, is, a, is a much less sexy story where if it can even detect me, I am like, oh my God, this is, everything is going right. And it, it is really, really hard to even figure out enough about the, at the person during runtime for us to answer interesting questions. So can I, uh, I, just for the sake of provocation, let me ask you a question. I mean, a lot of your point seems to be, oh, this technology is so behind, we shouldn't worry about it, let's not worry about it. I mean, is that what you're trying to say? Because no, no, I would no. say a lot of the problems are already here now without self-driving vehicles yeah. and deserve to be seriously considered already. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. So let me be really clear. I think you have a lot of reasons to be scared. <laughs> what, what I mean to say is I don't think you have to be scared of a super intelligence or an autonomous system arriving tomorrow that is going to take your job. What I think you need to be concerned about is the artificial intelligence that can do a 90% good enough job and for humans to take that 90% answer and then run with it. And I think the perfect example of that is, for example, the hiring system that Amazon had several years ago, which was driven a lot by artificial intelligence and which they realized had a very discriminatory effect on the way that they hired people. Now, fortunately for them, they recognized this problem and realized that this is probably not a system that they needed to, to have in place. But if I was taking the type of system I had right now and driving it around Carytown, collecting data about, about Rom and realized that Rom had a specific type of deficiency, maybe he, he really liked Pizza House and now I should market stuff to Pizza House and that, they got it 90% right. You know, maybe I actually don't like Pizza House, but I like you know, uh, Mani's pizza. Well, I mean, that is not going to kill me, but is certainly going to be the type of bias that over time can drive lots of problematic concerns. And I think that's what we should be most concerned about tomorrow, and we need to start thinking about now. Because it's not going to look like the privacy laws that we have in Europe, for instance. It's not something where I can just say, I'm not going to use Facebook anymore or allow them to collect the data, or I'm going to acknowledge that they're collecting my data. These are systems that are going to be operating out in the real world, in public environments, collecting your data, and you're not going to be able to sign off and say, hey, use my data. They're using it already. Although I would say that's exactly what regulation could address. Should do. Yeah. yeah. So I'm holding so the microphone, <laughs> I, like a couple of sentences ago. Uh, there was the, the, the notion of uh, uh, ROM and finding ROM <laughs> in the universe and doing sure. something about it. Um, I wanted to point out that one of the things I've seen in aviation and the drone world is that right now we're close enough to full autonomy that people trust it too much. They buy a widget, they open the box, they double click on the user interface icon and they think they're a pilot. That's a dangerous thing. These are the people that are flying near Detroit Metro, by the way. But they're also doing dangerous things, but they don't know that's dangerous. So that's something that also needs to be reconciled because we're at the 90% level for the little toys that you buy. We're not at the 99.99 .99 with many 9% level that we are with multi-billion dollar well-designed planes. I just wanted to say I really appreciate the attention to privacy in these issues because I think you're right, that's the horse that's already out of the barn. But I, I wanted to um, ask whether the car companies, for example, in pushing the AI testing of autonomous vehicles, where you're looking at, you're taking lots of images of people to analyze and learn, what kind of attention to privacy is happening with, uh, you know, are they aware of these issues? You obviously are. are. Are they aware of them and taking that seriously as part of the development of an autonomous vehicle? Well, you know, Google's Street View already got into trouble many times because of just things that inadvertently, you know, showed up on their, their views. And, you know, unfortunately, I think we're, we're mostly relying on shame and embarrassment as the main impediment to uh, full exploitation of, uh, of things. I'm not sure that's a strong enough force when there are countervailing um, economic forces. Um, I, I, I'm not, we, I'm, the, the dissident series, I think, has had whole... Um, you know, sessions, and we'll have more on on, on privacy um, itself. But I think you know, certainly AI is an accelerator on the the ways that it can uh, become useful. I guess I guess all I would suggest is um, a, a couple of you know uh, twists. One is it's not just personal privacy, but it's just the power that aggregating lots of information that one can have. It could be that. We may get no information about any one individual, but still, it would change the balance of um, you know effects on on populations by by, by that kind of collection. Um, and I think you know the other is that we may need to uh, move the boundary to what we care about is not necessarily what information is collected, but really how it's used. And put some attention into developing ways to audit. Uh, you know, for what purposes is the AI, is the company, AI, whatever, uh, use that information to find a way to, to validate that it, it keeps to those purposes. Hi, thank you, first of all, for coming out. Um, I was looking at your website, uh, or the, the website about this event, 
and um, it mentions taking a multidisciplinary look at the social implications of AI and considering the promises and potential pitfalls that we may look forward to. And I, I think it's kind of everybody probably thinks about this, no matter what field you're in, what kind of tech field you're in. But let me just make a quick analogy in the whole um, uh, roundabout, automobile roundabouts that that kind of came very quickly and now they're here and people are trying to navigate it. And I don't know how it went in Europe, how it was handled, um, but it seems like they do it better over there. At least people seem to drive them better over there. And here they were plunked down and there was no retrofitting of in information about teaching You've been driving for 20 years. Let's show you how to use a roundabout. That didn't happen. Um, when it comes to AI and any kind of tech like this that's going to kind of infiltrate everybody's lives, what is the, uh, is there a system, and maybe you all have something to, to speak to this, is there a system of letting people know what's coming and how we should get, like this sort of thing is fascinating and perfect and wonderful and we need it, but how do you do that this is a very small group of people? Um, when it comes to what is the effect on the random person and how does that random person educate themselves or get given education about what's coming down the line? Just anybody who wants to speak to that. Thank you. Well, I guess all, um, the first part is it, there's a presumption maybe that we would know how to educate <laughs> anybody about dealing um, with these things. They, they may get deployed before we really even understand what one would have to know to, to deal with it better. Yeah, so where to start? I mean, uh, at the University of Michigan, computer science enrollment is out of control, and Mike's trying to fix that, right? <laughs> Maybe. No, fix Good it luck. by having more faculty and so on. Um, I mean, let me hold up my phone. If you go back to the dark ages when I was an undergrad, um, I would claim that the people around me, including me, were more willing to learn the foundations of computer science than they are now. And the reason for that is because people think they're experts, just like with the drones, by being able to click the menus on phone apps, right? And, and that's a huge issue, and I'm glad to see the School of Information and, and others around the room nodding yes. So we kind of have this facade going where we still realize if we're actually to find careers in math, science, any of the STEM fields, computer science, and so on, we know we have to have fundamentals of physics and calculus and all of the other things that go along with that. But somehow the community, even a lot of the STEM fields, have forgotten that we're relying on this without understanding it. So I think that really, for me, is the foundation of making sure that we think carefully as individuals and as society going forward. Now I'm talking mostly about the people who would be here at the University of Michigan studying. There's a whole lot of people who would never come to a university at all, and I think for them, um, T typically what's happened is there has been instructions and you learn to connect intuition with how things work and I guess maybe right now I'm thinking to like mechanics or um, electricians who wire homes and there's a lot of really useful kind of hands-on experience you can get with instructions and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble. I grew up on a farm in West Virginia. All of my relatives are mechanics and farmers, right? So I'm thinking of them as I say this. And I have the greatest respect for their intellect, but they totally use a phone as a widget without understanding what's in it. And that's the way it's going to be for the indefinite future. Um, I would say, you know, so in my rocket analogy and astronaut analogy, you know, one of the challenges with more advanced technology, especially to the degree that it's infused our lives, is it raises the bar for how much everybody is required to know to really be able to participate as a citizen to influence policy. And, um, and you know, I'll go back to, I think we are entering a phase where we should be more conservative with respect to innovation. You know, we generally, we believe the word innovation is always a positive thing, and I think that's wrong. It's not, it's not necessarily positive, and I think in the rich world, we're at a point where more innovation is not necessarily good for society as a whole, and so we should be willing to, you know, to put friction in the system to slow it down so that there's time for society to adjust and to, you know, learn these things rather than just assuming that more new stuff is necessarily making the world a better place. 
And uh, I'll just I'll end by saying, you know, I, I think actually in a lot of ways what we need is a useful notion of abstraction. And so what I mean by that is, you know, um, I, for instance, you know, uh, work in a mechanical engineering department, but if you asked me how my car worked and asked it to me in a gory detail, I, I wouldn't be able to describe how a powertrain worked. This isn't being recorded, right? Um, <laughs> in, in any case, uh, what I mean by that is, nevertheless, I can understand the rules to operate a vehicle and follow this common sense laws because, you know, I've been presented with a license that forced me to take an exam and, and learn some core tenets of what it meant to follow the rules. And when I ch showed my chart up there, I presented sort of modern traffic rules as this big insight that reduced the number of accidents. And what I'd argue here is we need a, a, a nominal abstraction where you don't necessarily need to understand the inner workings of a cell phone or Reddit or all of these other things, but you need to understand sort of the common sense rules of what it means to operate in and around these things. And we, I mean, as instructors, I, I mean, we have to figure out that right abstraction, and that's really hard to do, but it's certainly something that uh, I think we will be presented with that challenge and have to deal with as we move forward. So we are out of time. Uh, first, a round of applause for our, our panelists. <laughs> I would say a round of applause for putting up with the overflow room. So thank you all for our, uh, enjoying the last dissonant session. Usually I come up with sort of pithy summaries, but you guys did a phenomenal job encapsulating an hour of stimulating conversation in your final remarks. For those of you who are wondering, you know, how do we learn more? Part of why we do this for dissonance and why we are here at the university is to stimulate thought. We don't have all the answers. We rely on you to bring us with as many of the answers as we can provide you. So come to future sessions, sign up, go to safecomputing.umich.edu. You can find more of the past sessions. There's refreshments, there's some swag at the front table. And if you all are hanging around, maybe you're open to talking to people, but thank you again so much.